My name is Caleb Reinhardt. Um, I, don't, I haven't met you before, so how are you? Um, so if you guys don't know already, I'm going to be presenting on the peopleometer. Um, for about two years now, I've been using the peopleometer, and I love the device. Um, I loved it so much that I decided to become per diem at Neuroptics. Um, so I'm actually responsible now for educating nurses and physicians in the uh, Northern Virginia, Maryland, and West Virginia areas. Um, so I want to really just talk to you guys about the peopleometer, and I want you guys to be experts by the end of this presentation, if you guys aren't already. So um, things that I'm going to be going over today um, include the, uh, the limitations of manual assessments and the many benefits of peopleometry. Um, I'm also going to be doing a demo for you all. Um, it's going to be a little icebreaker. And then I will go over the uh, scientific and clinical research um, about the peopleometer and all of its benefits. And then finally, I'm going to talk about how you should incorporate pe peopleometer in the care of your patients on a daily basis. Um, so current limitations um, right now um, for manual assessments include patients with small pupils, um, irises that are very dark, um, inconsistent lightings in the room, strength of flashlight, pen light. Um, we also, as nurses, we tend to use subjective terminology like sluggish or brisk or non-reactive. For example, um, Stacy's um, term sluggish, uh, her you know, presentation of that is going to be different than Ashley's. Um, so um, there's also high inter-examiner variability and there's also a severe lack of reliability and there's actually an article that I want to cover on the next slide that goes over that. So um, this article, um, it talks about the inter-rated reliability of pupillary assessments um, and ultimately what it shows is that the practitioner agreement for um, manual assessments was very low. Um, also one thing that I really wanted to go over was that out of 189 observations of a fixed pupil, only less than 50% were scored as fixed by both practitioners. And only 33.3% were in fact um, fixed by the pupilometer, which is the more accurate and reliable assessment. So what is this telling us? It's, 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 it's telling us that as, as nurses, we tend to overestimate non-reactive pupils by manual examinations. And with uh, the pupilometer, um, I know for you know, several of us, we, we look at a pupil and sometimes we say, oh, look, it's non-reactive with the flashlight. We go ahead, use the pupilometer, and in fact, the pupils are sluggish, 2.2, 2.4, and this really changes our course of action and um, changes our course of intervention for that patient. And um, this is kind of like our pledge at Neuroptics. So uh, the, uh, the pupilometer here, it provides accurate, reliable, and objective and pupil size reactivity data, independent of examiner. Independent of examiner, that means anyone who's using the instrument is gonna get the same results every time. Um, pupil size and reactivity are also expressed numerically and graphically. So for the first time, we can trend these pupil changes over time. Um, so, and I'm actually going to do a demo in just a little bit, uh, but this is just an intro to what the pupilometer is. Um, most of you guys know most of the information, but one things, um, some things I actually want to highlight is that when you're actually doing a exam on a patient, you're taking 90 images of the pupil light, flex, uh, light reflex over three seconds. So that's why it's important when you have the pupilometer on the patient to keep it there for three seconds. Okay, if you move it away too soon, you won't get results. So that's why you know sometimes you get that red data because you're moving away the pupilometer too soon. All right. Um, also, the, uh, the pupilometer also comes with an optional barcode scanner, which we don't have, so I'm not gonna cover that. And then I'm also, um, they also right now have an optional smart card reader that allows you to automatically upload into Epic. And I think we're actually thinking about working on that with you guys soon. You are very welcome. <laughs> All right, so um, now I'm going to do a, a quick demo.
Okay, so for those of you who don't know, this handle here has a battery in it. That's why we have to actually charge it, okay? <laughs> All right, pretty obvious. So when you're, when you're not charging it, what will happen sometimes is the screen will turn dark, okay? It's telling us that it's trying to conserve battery power. So in order to turn it back on, just press anywhere on the screen, put it in the, uh, the charging station, or what sometimes you have to do is you have to actually hold the up button for three seconds. A good way to remember that is hold up for three seconds to wake up, uh -huh. right? <laughs> So now I'm going to go over the smart card, okay? Do you guys know what's called a smart card? All right. Well, so it's a plastic piece that actually fits over the camera. It allows for a consistent exam every single time, okay? It also has this memory chip inside, and it actually allows you to store 168 paired people assessments or hourly assessments for a whole week. So essentially, if you want to do... Um, hourly assessments on your patient, you can do that for a whole week with the, uh, this smart card reader. Um, it also stores the patient's ID, and then it also stores all the patient's people data. Um, for those of you, you know, you know that you can't use it on multiple <coughs> patients. There's also a way to actually destroy the, uh, the data as well um, when you're discharging a patient. And I can show you that as well later. All right. So before I actually do an assessment on my eye, okay, I want you, I'm going to give you candy for it, to tell me <laughs> what the size of my pupils are. <laughs> it's all right. I, I'm going to do an experience. I'm going to do an experience. I'm going to do it with an experienced nurse as well. About three? All right. Oh, yeah, three. About a three, okay. We, we, we tend to underestimate pupil sizes with manual examinations. So attaching the smart card is really simple, okay? Uh, before you even put the smart card on the pupilometer, it's also important to put the patient ID label on as well, so you can remember it's for that patient. So you're going to put it on, snap it on like so, really easy. Okay. You should hear a click that tells you the smart card's on. Okay, now you can enter the ID in. We don't have the barcode scanner, so you're going to scroll over to manual ID. It's important to put the patient's actual MRN in. What's that? Are you going to get a barcode? What, the barcode scanner? Yeah. I can't do it physically, but um, I can talk to the, the, men, the people in charge and try to expedite that process for everyone. Yeah. So, for example, if you're putting the patient's MRN as 1212, Easy as that. Hit accept. Now you're ready to scan that patient. Also, I don't know if you guys know, it's also touch screen. When, did you guys all know that? So as you guys can see here, um, it's going to show the ID on the top of the screen. And it's also going to show you the amount of assessments you've done out of 168. So since I just put this on, it's going to say 0 out of 168. So now you're actually ready to scan the patient now. Um, before I go over the results, I'm going to do a scan on me. So when you're actually scanning yourself, it's very important to make sure this is on the top of the cheekbone. Also make sure you're not tilting the device whatsoever. Also with patients who have fractures in their face, you can also do it on their forehead. Um, just make sure that you're pressing the right button. These are like shutter buttons on the camera. Hit the right for the right eye, hit the left for the left eye. Okay? So I'm going to do a scan on myself. Super fun, right? I've done it a million times now. Okay, once you, see, once you see that green circle, you're going to release the button and keep the pupilometer there for three seconds. It's taking 90 pictures of light reflex, remember. Did the results come up? Yeah. All right. So now we're going to go over the results. Okay, as you can see on the left screen, it's going to initially show you one of two. Okay, so there's three columns and two rows. The green data is always the right eye. The yellow is always the left eye. And then that third column shows you the difference in pupil size and then also reactivity. 
So I'm going to first go over size. Um, so for my right eye, you guys said it was about a three? Ha. It was actually a seven on the right and left eye. My eyes are consistently sevens. I know, it's weird. Christine, Christine always notices it when I come in. She says, why are your pupils so big? <laughs> uh, uh, so, so, yeah, we do underestimate. Uh, so don't feel bad. She also thought it was a three. And she's been a nurse for how many years now? For a long time. No, I'm not, I'm not dissing you or anything. I'm just saying that, you know, it's a compliment. Yes, it's a, it's a compliment. So as you can see here, the size is actually slightly different in 3.09 and 3.63. In order for a patient's pupil to be truly anascoric, it has to be greater than one millimeter. Okay? Does that make sense for everyone? All right, and now I'm going to go over. Um, this is a middle row um, here as well, and this is the results page two of two. So some, some of our pupilometers are set to results page two of two, and it'll show you all these other parameters, like um, contriction velocity. All of these variables just go into equating NPI. So we really only want to focus on NPI and size for our assessments, okay? These top two rows. And this guy here, um, after you do an assessment, um, you can also play this play button, and it, also, it shows you um, from baseline to constriction to redilation, the light reflex, okay? Um, I remember Dr. Zakaria a few months ago, um, I said the MPI of our patient was 2.2 on the right side and 3.8 on the left side. They had swelling on the right side, which would explain the sluggishness on the right side. She asked to actually look at the, the light reflex in the video because she, she thought that that right eye was, was non-reactive. So I showed it to her and she said, oh, well, sluggish. So something to remember. So actually, wait, oops. I wanted to ask. So who can tell me what's brisk and what's sluggish? Raise your hand and, and uh, I'll give you candy. Stacy did it first. Uh, okay, if, if it's three or if it's less than three, it would just be because it's sluggish. Mm -hmm. If it's greater than three, it would just be because it's reactive. Mm -hmm. Three or above reactive. Three or above yep. Reactive. D not, yep. Okay. Very good. What would you like? Milky Way? Just toss anything, doesn't matter. Okay. Just toss. There you go. So yes, that is correct. So MPI, it's the, the measure of reactivity. So you're not guessing at how sluggish or brisk a pupil is anymore. And it's also measured on a scale of 0 to 4.9. So as you go up in the scale, your pupils are becoming more brisk. As you're going down in the scale, your pupils are becoming more sluggish. And then if it's 0, your pupils are non-reactive. OK, so right here, my MPIs on my right is a 3.7, and the left is a 3.8. Okay, so my pupils are brisk. Um, one thing, or a couple things I want to emphasize to you guys, if there's also a difference in MPI greater than 0.7, it can tell you that something's happening focally on one side of the brain. Okay, so say you have someone who has um, a pupil on the MPI whose right is like a 3.1 and the left is a 4.2, it can tell you that something's happening on that one side of the brain where the pupil is more sluggish. Okay? Also, it's very important to trend the MPIs over time for patients. So say, for example, if you have an MPI of 4.1 one hour, the next hour is 3.1. Yes, in fact, that's still brisk, but that's a huge drop in MPI, and it's something that you would tell a provider. Um, this is also a way to just review the data um, graphically. And then also, if you want to go back to the home screen, you just hit the right or left button. This folder here allows you to look at every um, patient data that you've used the uh, pupilometer on. Okay, in this settings and tools, you can change the date, you can change the time, and you can also do something that's called, you disable the smart guard. I'm not sure if you guys know what this feature is. So you can actually disable a smart guard for HIPAA um, reasons. So you can't actually store any other um, data into this MPI and you can't use that smart guard on anybody else, okay? So the demo's over, sorry. So now I'm actually gonna go over the instances when the pupilometer would come in handy. So every patient that's admitted to a high acuity area has the potential for neurological deterioration related to primary medical diagnoses. For example, stroke, our TBIs, our subarachnoid hemorrhages, subdural hematoma, you guys, you guys know it. Um, 
Also, it's important to use in patients that have secondary effects from their primary diagnoses. For example, after cardiac arrest. Um, I found the statistic really, really um, staggering, actually, that after CPR, only 10% of people actually survive. And only 8% actually have a good neurological outcome. In terms of hepatic encephalopathy, it's when um, you have liver breakdown and it creates toxins that builds up in your brain and this actually creates edema in your brain. So another important thing to use the pupillometer on. Also, um, effects of therapeutic measures are also some things that can cause neurological deterioration. For example, with sedation and mechanical ventilation, I'll go over that later. Um, and then also ECMO. So ECMO is very important in supporting a patient if they have refractory pulmonary or cardiac failure. And while it's very important, 43% of ECMO deaths are actually related to intracranial hemorrhage. And then targeted temperature management, important in a lot of our patients on our unit and also patients that are post-cardiac arrest. However, this can also lead to neurological problems as well. So this is just a, a protocol that St. Joseph Health developed, and it kind of just goes over other indications where it would, it would be essential to use a pupillometer. Um, in cases like DVT, um, substance abuse, withdrawal, di uh, diabetic, uh, diabetic, diabetic uh, ketoacidosis. So now I want to go over some of the scientific and clinical research. There's a lot right now um, that's out about the benefits of the pupillometer on several different patient populations. I don't know why I'm still holding the pupillometer. <laughs> so this one I really, really enjoyed. Um, it's called Saved by the Pupillometer. It's actually a case study of a 70-year-old man who was transported to the ED. Um, you see these patients all the time. Uh, the GCS of the patient was five. He had a 17 millimeter midline shift. He was then transferred to OR for a craniotomy and evacuation. Before induction, they did a uh, manual assessment of his pupils and they found them both uh, non-reactive. So they uh, diagnosed him with uncle herniation and brainstem compromise. So then he was transferred to the neuro ICU for brain test testing. So he went up to the neuro, neuro ICU. The nurses up there used the pupillometer. His right MPI was in fact 2.6 and his left was um, 3.8. So they led him back to the craniotomy and it led to his eventual recovery and he went to rehab. So it just shows you that this really can save patients' lives. And I've had patients before that have come up from OR. Um, the OR nurse will tell me that, you know, I remember I had a hemicrany patient because um, uh, they had really bad ICH. And the pupil on the left side was brisk and they told me that the right was non-reactive. They came up to the, the unit, the left was still brisk the right, where the injury was, the, uh, the pupil was in fact non-reactive, or sorry, was, was sluggish. So we ended up giving the patient mannitol and within 20 to 30 minutes, the patient's pupil was brisk again. And I remember that patient, he was there for a long time, he was actually in 14, but he, he eventually uh, recovered. So th this, um, this, this article just talks about the correlation of MPI and ICP. It showed a negative correlation between NPI and ICP. So, for example, when the NPI decreases, the ICPs were increasing in these patients that they studied. In fact, in the abnormal NPI group, the patients that had less than three, their average ICP peak was actually 30.5. And in the patients that had non-reactive NPIs, so zero, the average ICP peak was 33.8. Um, another staggering, staggering statistic. So. In these patients with abnormal pupil reactivity, it actually occurred on average 16 hours before peaks in ICP. So before the patient exper started experiencing increased ICPs, increased swelling, increased pain, the MPIs were sluggish. So it leads to early action with these, the pupillometer. So I thought this was also um, very pertinent to, to our uh, unit because we use osmotic therapy on our patients. So it, it, it goes over patients that received hypertonic saline and then also mannitol. Um, and the most common indications were patients with ICH, TBI, and stroke. Um, they did a, uh, a CT scan uh, within two hours of osmotic therapy 
and it showed that there was significant improvements within two hours of administration of osmotic therapy. Sorry, I, I get that all mixed up. So they did after the uh, the initial the uh, the initial stroke or initial ICH, they would they would actually do a um, scan six hours after it occurred, and then based on what the the CT showed, they would give the patient mannitol or 23%. Within two hours of that being received, the MPIs actually improved. Um, this was also significant and independent of other interventions, including CSF diversion, blood pressure management, sedation, pain management, et cetera. This is kind of a, a transition from, from Sam's Sam's PowerPoint. So it talks about the detection of delayed cerebral ischemia using objective pupillometry in patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage. And in this study, they studied 56 patients that were receiving hourly NPI pupillometer exams, and then also they were receiving transcranial Dopplers. Out of, that, out of the 56 patients that had subarachnoid hemorrhage, 12 of them experienced delayed cerebral ischemia. And out of those 12, 10 had vasospasm. Pupillometer changes with MPI decreases to less than three were strongly associated with DCI or the onset of DCI and deterioration of the patient. And in fact, in seven of the 12 patients, they had abnormal drops in their NPI. And in five out of the seven patients, these changes or the drops in MPI occurred eight hours before deterioration or DCI. Does that make sense? So five of these seven patients had MPIs that decreased eight hours before DCI. That's why it's important to use a pupillometer because it leads to early detection. This is, I'm just gonna summarize this real quick. It talks about um, midline shift um, and its correlation with pupillometry. It found that in patients with decreasing MPI, it correlates with actually increasing midline shift as well based off um, CT exams or MRIs. So these are also research articles about the secondary um, brain injury patients. Okay, so we see a lot of patients that are on mechanical ventilation and sedation on our units. Neurological deterioration can occur from hypoventilation, hypoxia, and abnormal CO2 distribution through the body. It can lead to less blood supply to the brain. Also with sedation, it reduces our ability to do motor assessments and verbal assessments. So that's why it's important to use a pupillometer in our patients that are pupils only, or we're using um, pain medication or sedation to um, minimize their I ICP stimulation. Um, so this is also a, a really, um, I like this article a lot. It's actually the first study of its kind to assess the prognostic value of NPI using, or sorry, pupillary activity using NPI. So it involved 456 patients, and in these patients, their GCS was less than six, and it was, they were resuscitated post-cardiac arrest and treated with target temperature management. So the study actually had two primary objectives. First, to predict an unfavorable neuro outcome three months after cardiac arrest and also to evaluate whether MPI can help discriminate between good outcome, so full recovery or moderate disability, versus unfavorable outcome, so severe disability. So overall, the results showed that measuring MPI in coma patients post-cardiac arrest actually predicted an unfavorable outcome in three months. So we do get a lot of post-anoxic brain injury patients, and oftentimes those patients are both non-reactive in, in both eyes. The most striking results I also found that NPI had 100% um, predictive, hold on one second. Uh, I'll give candy for who can tell me what this stands for. Yeah, predictive prognostic value, 100, meaning 100% of patients that even had one NPI reading of less than two had an unfavorable outcome. NPIs also had 100% specificity, meaning all patients 100% with the good outcome had zero NPI readings of less than two. So I'm gonna go over how to really incorporate pupillometry into clinical practice and how you should be using it on the unit. So when they come up to the ICU, 
I mean, it would be ideal if they would start um, peopleometry in the ED. They do have a peopleometer in the ED right now, and they have started to use it, but it would be beneficial if they um, you know, continue to use it more. It benefits us and it benefits the patient. So when they come to the unit, establish a baseline. Okay, so use the people on the patient. See what their people sizes and MPIs are. After that, continue to use it for routine people exams. And then after that, it should be used in any patient, or just in general, it should be used in any patient that has clinical, that has potential for clinical deterioration. So any patient in the ICU has potential for clinical deterioration, not just our sedated or ventilated patients. Um, this just goes over um, what hospitals right now in the U.S. are using pupillometry. Um, as you can see here, a lot of the uh, top 50 hospitals are using pupillometry. So in summary, the uh, pupillometer reliably, uh, reliably detects smaller changes in the, pupil, the pupil's eye or the human eye and allows trending of gradual changes. MPI also allows you to quantify reactivity so you're not guessing at how sluggish, um, brisk, or non-reactive a pupil is. Okay. I also really want to go over a story of mine that really hits home, I think, with a lot of you guys. Um, it was about a patient who was in room 19. Um, I'm not going to say who the name was, but uh, he, he kept saying, hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer. Um, so, yeah, um, I love that guy. But anyway, um, he, he had a, uh, I believe it was a GBM, and they were only able to remove part of the uh, GBM. So after surgery, when he came up, I remember he had a lot of pain. Um, he was you know, going in and out of consciousness. Um, I had him the second day he was on the unit. The first day they used the pupillometer on him, MPIs were 4.1 on, on the right and then 4.2 on the left. That pupil on his right side when I came in that morning, um, he was having trouble opening his eye. It just looked very dilated. Um, According to uh, the nurses and physicians, the, the pupil was sluggish over the last day. But when I checked the MPI of his right side, the MPI on that right side was actually 2.2, and the left was 4.2. So I called, I called Dr. Sicaria. I told her what my findings were, and she asked me, oh, what was his MPI previously? And the MPI previously was two days before. His MPI was ac actually 4.2. So Dr. Zakaria decided to go ahead and give the patient 23%. It was hilarious because the guy was like pretty intact too. He was just drinking a Powerade, but he was like in a lot of pain and he couldn't open his eyes. So then we, we gave him the 23% uh, the and literally 30 minutes, he was happy again. He, he wasn't as aphasic. He wasn't just saying hand sanitizer. <laughs> um, and he uh, wasn't, in, it wasn't in pain. Um, but over the course of the day, every four or five hours, he would have this similar trend. His, his heart rate would decrease um, along with he, he would show the signs of pain and we would give him 23% and within 20, 30 minutes he was okay again. Um, and then over the course of several days, I believe we used the people I'm going to coin a bit on him and it really allowed us to intervene quickly with him and eventually what we did is we, 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 gave, the, we gave him a shunt and he eventually recovered. But I feel like if we didn't ever use the pupillometer that day, he, he, could, have, he could have potentially herniated and he, he wouldn't have had a good outcome. And I really loved him and, and his family. So that's why that really hits home with me and I'm sure it hits home with you guys. And I, I know the pupillometer is, is something that's really helped you guys and your care of your patients. And that's why I just wanna make sure that you guys are using it in the most effective way for your patients. Um, so these are just the, a review of the clinical topics. Thanks, any questions?